When I started talking about <clears throat> opening a cultural center, people started talking to me about their hopes and their dreams and all the creative things that they've been thinking about. And I ended up meeting hundreds and hundreds of artists and writers and poets and um, playwrights and mm -hmm. actors. Mm -hmm. And it just couldn't be just a bookshop yes. anymore. It yes. became um, a gallery space. Now we have two galleries. It became a place where we're planning a play. Um, wow. It's, there's just so much more in it. We do this mother's program um, to help women who have gaps in their CVs, who've been taking care of children for mm. some years, um, to go back to the workforce outside the home. And that has been one of the most wonderful things that we've done so far, although we've done so many wonderful things. So we tried to kind of all these tests. I retired. But yeah, thank you. All right, we are back. And um, with today's episode of Tell Me Why, we are bringing back Get to Know the CEO or Get to Know a founder of a business or a venture here in the UAE, in Dubai specifically, um, that is uh, slowly making it and slowly, you know, jumping, you know, all the challenges and the hurdles and the obstacles that come their way and are here to share their story to be an inspiration for all. So with me in the studio is Shada al Mutawa, who is the founder and CEO of Katubna Cultural Center. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's lovely having you, Shada. How are you? How is the way in? How's the weather outside? We know it's uh, crazy hot right now. Everything is wonderful. Yeah. I got to spend this morning with my daughter, which nice. was a special treat because nice. normally she would be at daycare. Nice. So I really enjoyed that. That's nice. I love those like slow and peaceful mornings that you get some quality time with family members. That's uh, that's lovely. It's lovely to hear. Okay, so Shada, before we get into like all the technicalities, um, I want to get to know you first. So, um, what is your background, like your professional background, and how did Kotobna come to life? I started my career as a professor, actually. Okay. I um, went to the U.S. at the age of 16. Okay. And I continued my studies there. I got my master's and my Ph.D., and then I went on to teach for about 10 years in Amazing. the U.S. In May 2022, I had my daughter, who is now two years old, and that changed my priorities completely. Okay. Um, I felt that it was very important to raise her in my country and near our family mm -hmm. so she can know them and they know her from the beginning of her life. Of course. So I made a, a decision that felt at once extremely difficult and at the same time extremely easy mm -hmm. to leave my job as a professor at American University in Washington, D.C. Wow. And come and... Um, start something new here yeah. in Dubai. Yeah. And it was a really good decision. I'm very, very happy um, that I made it and very glad to see my daughter spending so much time with her cousins and, you know, just all the hugs and kisses yes. and, you know, just how much she loves her grandparents and yes. aunts and, and all that. It is a tough decision, I have to say. And, you know, um, you mentioning how important it was for you to have your daughter um, basically submerged in that family environment resonates with me because I grew up far away from cousins, um, grandparents, and it's something that I feel like I wouldn't want for my children. I don't want them to miss out on that. So I applaud you for that. That's not an easy step. I mean, to up and go and just, you know, leave everything behind. So I do applaud you for that. And um, your daughter is lucky to have you. Um, <laughs> but is it safe to say that your daughter is the reason you started Kotobna? 100%. Okay. She is, absolutely. I wouldn't have left my job in the U.S., especially at that moment, because it was it felt like I was at the height of my career. Mm -hmm. um, I had everything that I wanted in terms of my job and my ability to do research and the freedom that I had to pursue any question I was interested mm -hmm. in, designing courses, 
anyway I liked. Um, I had so much research money to just fly wherever I wanted and go to libraries or just research anything. Really, I could I could spend my life um, doing what I wanted. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's so much more important for me that she gets to have the childhood that I had. I was very, very lucky to Amazing. grow up with cousins. Mm-hmm. And I, growing up, I had, I guess I still do have cousins in two countries, in Kuwait and in Dubai. Okay. And so I grew up, you know, going back and forth and mm-hmm. being with, with all of these cousins. And I just couldn't imagine her not having anyone right. nearby who's family. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's beautiful. Okay, so diving into Kotobna, can you just explain what it is? I mean, for those who don't know or have never heard of it, sure. And like when, like when did it come to life? And like um, everything about the the bookshop or the cultural center? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so it is a community space. I think is the best way to describe it. Okay. It's a space for creative people. And it combines a lot of things that I love in okay. life. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's books. So we have a bookshop. We also have a coffee shop. Nice. Coffee is a new love and passion for me since I started the coffee shop. Okay. Um, and we have event spaces. And we have two kinds of event spaces. So we have event spaces for adults and we have event spaces for kids. Okay. So we have a playroom and a reading room for children where we do events with authors. For example, an author would come and read their book and then the kids would do some kind of arts or crafts activity related to the book. Uh, we've done an art workshop, an mm-hmm. art appreciation workshop, and a uh, music appreciation workshop. Wow. Where nice. kids as young as six months old would listen to uh, classical Arabic songs oh. and identify the instruments. And they got to see the instruments and play with them. And it was really, really I fun. I love that. Okay. Yeah. For adults, we have a lecture area and we have a workshop space. We do writing groups. We have writing workshops. We have a humanities festival that's a lecture series okay. where we feature um, a speaker who is from the Gulf and who does research related to the Gulf. And it could be anything, philosophy, religion, uh, literature, history. We've had some very, very interesting speakers. Wow. That's uh, that's incredible. I mean, you put it very um, well. It's a community center. It's a community space. It's uh, it's somewhere for people to get together and share their passion for whatever. I mean, music, culture, you know, history, um, anything. And I absolutely love that. But I just want to play devil's advocate for for just a second. Would you say that reading or books, physical books, are a dying art? No, not okay. at all. Not for a minute, not okay. for a second. Um, I grew up with this idea that people here don't like to read mm. and Arabs don't like books. You mm-hmm. know, it's I don't know where I got it from, but I still hear it. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, in general, in the world, we have the Internet. So people are watching Netflix or YouTube right. or whatever, and they're not reading books. But... Um, I didn't care because I'm not a business-minded person. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> I when I when I decided that I'm leaving my my um, career as a professor, I wanted to be with books, and I I I spend so much time in bookstores and bookshops and libraries, and it's where I feel the presence of God. Mm. <laughs> this is where I feel my, the strongest connection to God in my life. I feel so much inspiration and so much love and gratitude when I'm with books. So I thought, okay, if I'm leaving something that I really love, then I need to be with books. Mm-hmm. And the easiest thing in my mind at the time was, I'm just going to open a bookshop. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, I thought it was easy, but it's actually really, really hard yes. to own a bookshop. Yes. Even just like getting the books on the shelves is incredibly difficult for all kinds of reasons. Yes, yeah, so I decided, I decided that I had to be with books and... Um, 
in in the U.S., where I was going to book bookshops all the time, there would always be events. So yes. there would be authors giving readings from their new books, and there would be discussions and conversations and book clubs. And I was always going to writing workshops and things like this in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do this as well. And here, <clears throat> just in terms of business models and licensing, that meant opening a cultural center instead of a bookshop. You right. know, that's the title that's on the, you know, on the door. It's mm -hmm. a cultural center. Mm -hmm. But when I started talking about <clears throat> I'm opening a cultural center, people started talking to me about their hopes and their dreams and all the creative things that they've been thinking about. And I ended up meeting hundreds and hundreds of artists and writers and poets and um, playwrights and mm -hmm. actors. Mm -hmm. And it just couldn't be just a bookshop yes. anymore. It yes. became um, a gallery space. Now we have two galleries. It became a place where we're planning a play. Um, wow. It's, there's just so much more in it. We do this mother's program um, to help women who have gaps in their CVs, who've been taking care of children for mm -hmm. some years, um, to go back to the workforce outside the home. And that has been one of the most wonderful things that we've done so far, although we've done so many wonderful things. Um, but yeah, it's become I love that. something that I didn't expect that it would yeah. be. It's so much more than just a quote unquote bookshop or even a cultural center. I'm sorry, but like there's <laughs> so much more to it. I mean, you're helping uh, mothers or working mothers, uh, you know, get back into the field. And, you know, you're you're creating a safe space for people who just want to get together and, and just, you know, uh, live in, in, in good vibes, uh, share a, a yummy cup of coffee. And I just want to clarify, because I played the devil's advocate, but I love books. There's nothing more I love than that combination that you just mentioned, a book and a good cup of coffee, a big one as well, <laughs> so that it stays. But there's nothing more I enjoy than just grabbing a book, going, sitting by the beach or a cafe near the beach or whatever. I mean, even if it's in a little nook in my apartment and just getting lost in a book. The reason why I ask that question is because there I get that snarky comment from so many people where it's like, oh, you're still reading books? Like people listen to audiobooks and people are always walking around with their Kindles, which I love all, but I still have that soft spot for that physical book and turning those pages and taking notes in my books, like the especially like the the self development books and, and the psychology ones that I tend to enjoy a bit more now that I'm a bit older. I mean I used to like the fiction, but those are the ones I'm interested in. So that's why I wanted to ask you because I always get those comments like, Oh, you're still reading a book? Like who reads books these days? And in reality, a lot of people still do. Yes, I'm glad you brought me back to the yeah. question. <laughs> yes, uh, because when I started going to book fairs here and going to um, just talking to people who read and people who who have just approached me because I'm starting this cultural center, I realized that people really, really love books. Yes. And they're serious about their love of books and people have huge libraries. I yes. mean, I didn't know that. I just didn't imagine that so many people are like me, you mm. know, like rather than going and getting a nice car or a nice bag yeah. or... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're going and building libraries in their homes. I love um, that. And it's kind of an invisible world that's all around us. But but the number of writers, just writers that mm -hmm. I have met since I started or opened Kutubna mm. has been just astounding. Yeah. And these are people who read books, you know, like breathing. Yeah. It's just part of their life in every, every day, yes. every Every evening, mm. every morning, sometimes. Mm. So, yeah, I I know I know that we have so much that's pulling us away from books, but people are still reading. Mm. They are. Mm. They're reading and they're writing. Yeah, too. and I feel like the most important part in keeping that art going is tackling it from the roots. So, starting with the younger generations and getting them into that habit of 
holding a book, reading it, you know, learning new words, you know, looking up words. I remember my mom used to do that with me all the time. She would say, you know, read a book and, you know, challenge yourself. And if there's a word you don't know, underline it, look it up, and then use it in a sentence, like write it in three different sentences. And I thought that's crucial for the younger generations because we lack that these days with the technology and the advancements and the distractions. Um, so I, I love that. I love that you have initiatives for younger audiences as well and young readers. And um, uh, I think uh, this is what we need to capitalize on to keep that going and to keep it growing. I mean, we could talk about books all day. I mean, um, <laughs> before we dive into the logistics, what's your favorite book? Do you have a favorite book? No, every time I read a really good book, it becomes my favorite, <laughs> <Your> favorite. book. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. So yeah. <laughs> currently I'm reading Buthayna, uh, Buthayna Laisa's uh, most recent book, okay. and it's called Sharaf al Muhawala. Okay. And it's about uh, being a bookseller. She's a Kuwaiti uh, yes. bookshop owner, and, and she talks specifically about censorship in Kuwait and the history of that. But mm. it's... Um, it feels really special to read a book written by another Arab woman bookseller. Yes, exactly. Uh, it's not um, yes. what we think of when we think of a Khaliji woman, yeah. but um, I love that. Fantastic. I really, really love that. Fantastic. Okay. So um, moving away from like, you know, just talking about the titles and the authors and the initiatives, I want to talk to you as an entrepreneur, as a business owner. How has that been? since the inception of Kotobna. What are some of the successes? What are the challenges that you faced and how did you overcome them? It's very, very challenging being a businesswoman because I never imagined that I would be a businesswoman. Um, I am not a very logical thinker. I'm a very imaginative and creative thinker. Okay. So I like to exist in a reality of my own making. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I had to learn everything and I had to find people who will ground me and bring yeah. me back to reality. Absolutely. And I've been very, very fortunate that I, you know, I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. My father is a businessman. My sister is a very successful businesswoman. And they've been my mentors through all this. Amazing. And they've been um, teaching me how to do business and how to make the difficult decisions and uh, deal with the day-to-day -day reality of owning a business. Okay. But I've also gotten a lot of support from the community in general. Um, we have been incredibly fortunate to just be embraced by young Emirati people who mm -hmm. really value our mission which is to celebrate and promote Khaliji scholarship and literature. Okay. Um, we've had, for example, one person who is very dear to my heart, and I only met her because of Kutubna, um, is Budur Al Rahma. She's an NYU Abu Dhabi student, and she's graduating now this spring. Okay. She uh, she's the first person who volunteered. She found me on Twitter and she she was following me when I was teaching in the U.S. And she okay. told me I would love to volunteer. I am here. Tell me what you need and I'll do it. Wow. And we met and she ended up organizing this whole uh, Dubai Humanities Festival that we had. She found she researched and found all the speakers she contacted them she organized every single lecture just as a volunteer somebody who just loves knowledge and ideas and wisdom and and they were amazing i mean every wow. single one of them was just so incredible and the presence of the community at these events and you know seeing young people coming to hear about for example the role of Omani slaves in the 1800s in preserving mm. Omani literature. You know, like, I, th I thought when we were planning that lecture, for example, that, well, who cares about history now? And mm. who would be interested in manuscripts? And, you know, it's such a specific topic. Mm. But I was completely wrong. Yeah. That... Um, lecture, for example, was one of our most popular I'm sure. lectures, and yeah. so many young people were there. 
Wow. Wow. Absolutely. Uh, fantastic. I mean, uh, you mentioned, you know, family support and you mentioned the support of the community. There's nothing more rewarding than getting support from strangers, complete strangers, because with family and friends, you know, they're going to love you no matter what. But then when it comes from strangers, you feel like, okay, that's genuine because, I mean, there are no feelings there for them to like, you know, compliment me just because, uh, you know, they know me. So um, I think that's fantastic. But did you face anything throughout the journey that made you feel like, okay, am I making the right decision with this? Should I keep going or should I stop? Was there any like major obstacle that you had to overcome throughout it all? Maybe like obtaining titles or I mean, anything or... Every day. I mean, it's yeah. such hard work. And okay. having a cultural center that does so much is like owning five different businesses. Okay. You know, because just like installing an art exhibit requires so much information. And like, I never imagined any of it, you mm -hmm. know, like... How do you put a label on a wall? Like I never thought about right. it. Right, just like the mi the mi yeah. minute details. Yeah, exactly, yeah. and there were so many, so many moments where I was like, "There is just no way this is gonna work." Yeah, no way. You know, there were so many things that looked entirely impossible, and then at every point when I I was faced with that, where I'm like, "Oh, this is not gonna happen. There's no way this is gonna happen," somebody would would appear and would make it happen. And it was always just, it felt like a miracle. Nice. Uh, miracles unfolding. There was never a moment where I thought I would quit or I would stop because I'm doing this for my daughter. Right. I'm creating a community and a space and a home for her. Mm -hmm. So I will not give up. It doesn't matter how difficult it will be. You know, maybe when she's grown up and everything, then I can say, okay, well, enough with the <laughs> business <laughs> yeah. that doesn't make money. Yeah. Um, but for now, this is this is what I want for her. Mm. And this is where you want to be as well, I feel. Absolutely. This is, this is exactly where you want to be. Yes. You mentioned you left something that you loved, which was uh, teaching in the U.S., to come back and do something you absolutely love, <laughs> which is reading books and sharing that, you know, knowledge and that and having and building a community through your business. Um, I'm glad you mentioned your daughter, because my next question is, was it always challenging, you know, balancing between this new business that you started and being a mother at the same time, like a full time mother to a child who is four, uh, two now, right? Exactly. It's a constant pull, um, and it's heartbreaking some days. Like yesterday morning, um, my husband dropped me off at work, and she was in the back seat, and I went to kiss her and say goodbye, and she just held on to me, and she didn't Aww. want me to go, and I was just like, I'm going to die. I can't. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, I know. Um, so that's why today I decided to just take them. well, didn't take the, the morning off, but I didn't let her go to daycare and I kept yeah. her home and I just worked on my phone while she painted with the crayons next to me. Um, yes, it's it's really challenging because owning a business, you can work 24 hours a day, every day, and not be done with all the work. Right. And some things seem very urgent and some things are very urgent. You know, mm -hmm. after the, the floods we had here, bookshelves started falling. Mm. And you just don't know which one is going to fall next. And it's hard to know, you know, why exactly they're breaking the way they're breaking. So it's hard to plan for it and predict. And, you know, you have to. That happened an hour before our coffee shop opening. Oh, wow. So we were moving books off bookshelves that were, that were on the floor and then moving the bookshelves into storage and then trying to find places for the book. So yeah, there are moments that just feel like, I can't think about anything else. I have to deal with this disaster right, right now. Mm. And it does take time away um, from my daughter. And I, I'm sad about that. Okay. I, I mean, I want to be with her all day and all night, every day and every night. Um, but it also feels very important to do this. Um, I want to create the intellectual life for her 
that I felt I was missing when mm-hmm. I was young. I grew up in a family of readers and mm-hmm. people who care about ideas and knowledge. But I wanted also to be connected to people outside of my family mm. and to know my community in a deeper way than I knew them. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how. Now it's easier. Right. It's much more uh, um, likely for people, young people even, to meet other readers and book lovers and people who care about ideas. Um, but it feels different to create our own little universe no, that has course. all the things we love. Of course. And uh, I, I mean, I know you mentioned that you feel sad when, you, when you're not with her, but it should be rewarding to know that you're doing this also for her. So it's not like you're leaving her to do something completely different, but in a way it, it comes full circle. So you you might be leaving her for like a chunk of the day, but because you're doing something that will, you know, benefit her in the future, as you said. So I guess that's rewarding, isn't it? My, my constellation is that she loves daycare. Okay. She learns so much and she okay. loves learning. And the things that she learns are not things I can teach her because I just don't know enough about early child development right. to be able to um, offer her the kinds of things that, that they're offering her at mm-hmm. daycare. Mm-hmm. So that's the thing. I mean, some days when we take her to daycare, she just runs to her teacher and she has all this giant smile on her face. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which makes me jealous. <laughs> <laughs> All moms, yes, yes. <laughs> but yeah. but just seeing how much she's learning and how much yeah. she's enjoying the learning and yeah. her teacher, she loves her teachers. And that's important. Yeah, and that's she important. has friends, you know, they hold hands all day. Yeah. And she talks yeah. about them after school, even though she doesn't know how to say sentences yeah. yet, you know. <laughs> but that's um, sweet. That's sweet. That's my consolation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so going back to the business um, aspect of Kotobna, what's your advice for people who are looking to start a business or, or have an idea but just don't know where to start or don't know if this business will succeed or not? Well, my advice is not to do anything alone. Okay. Uh, my advice is to find all of your pillars, the people who will keep your business house uh, standing, Mm -hmm. um, the people who will shelter you as a business person, who will give you um, refuge in the hardest days, and the people who will give you courage and and, um, support when you feel like it's impossible. So I think it's it's going to look and mean different things for different people. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is no way I could have done this on my own. Okay. No way. There is absolutely no possibility of of me opening a business if I was just myself. I know many people do it and can do it. But for me, I need all of those people who mm-hmm. have been behind me in practical ways, emotional ways, and other ways. So the support system is crucial in your in your opinion? 100%. Okay. Yes. And do you feel like all businesses succeed and can soar if it's done right? Or do you feel like there are certain business models that are just not meant to be? I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. I mean, okay. I hear that so many businesses don't make it past the first six months or the first year, and I can understand that. I mean, mm-hmm. we're still not making enough money to cover our bills. Okay. Um, so we need even more community support. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can keep going and trying because there are so many people who are helping me. Right. I know I can pay my staff salaries, um, even if we're not co- covering our bills yet, mm-hmm. because I have people in my community who are helping me do this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't, I mean, I'm, like I said before, I, you know, I never studied business. I never even thought about being a business owner. Mm -hmm. So I'm still learning. Um, my definition of success is not a traditional definition of success. Right. Um, I mean, I don't know how things will happen most of the time. I just, they happen. We kind of find creative ways and um, 
Uh, yeah, and and they have been. I mean, like for example, when when we decided to open the space that Kutubna is in now was just basically, you know, dirt. It was mm-hmm. just sand. You know, not sand. You know, it was an, like an unfinished floor mm-hmm. and some pillars. Mm-hmm. And I've I had never done a fit out before, or planned a fit out, or supervised a construction project. Right. Um, we ended up recycling discarded materials from other projects, like nice. um, light fixtures that um, were in a grocery store that had closed down, and mm. door handles that were no longer needed, and glass panels that mm-hmm. uh, were discarded. So you know, like. When when I was reading about business plans, it was not part of my business plan to create a sustainable space. Right. But we ended up um, doing it anyway. Yeah, I mean, yeah. recycling has become a huge part of what we do. Nice. Just sort of, that's how it happened. Nice. I love that. Okay, my last question. Um, now that you are where you are now today, if you go back in time, would you do it all over again? Yes, definitely I would do it in a heartbeat. I would do it 10 years sooner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you would have left teaching ages ago and started it then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I may not have gotten a PhD even. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, and I thought it would be harder to connect with thinkers and writers and researchers and <clears throat> people who care about all the things that I care about. <clears throat> but it turned out to be a feast Mm -hmm. of connections and meetings and finding like-minded people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would do it sooner. And all over again. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) I love that. Shada, thank you so much for joining us today. This was lovely. I will pay Kutubna a visit because now (laughs) I'm so intrigued. You mentioned coffee and you mentioned books, so you had me at coffee and books. So I'm going to be there very, very soon, and I'd love to see you there. I would love to see you there as well. Thank you, Shada. Thank you.